Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Diane Harris. I'm Dean of the College of Humanities. And I'm delighted to be welcoming Dan Whaley to our campus this afternoon. Um, and I'm just going to give Dan a sort of an informal introduction. Um, I've known Dan for a little while. We first met when I was director of the Humanities Center at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, um, where Dan has, from whence, Dan has his undergraduate degree in English. And, but I first met Dan actually at a small meeting that was convened by the Mellon Foundation to talk about digital humanities and the future of several digital humanities projects. Um, and uh, learned a little bit more about Hypothesis after that and became um, very enthusiastic about it. Um, but before I, I say a little bit more about that, I'll just say again, Dan has an English degree from the University of Illinois um, and he then went on to do some incredibly important innovations in the uh, digital world, like uh, inventing the first travel reservation platform and also, I believe, the first e-commerce platform on the web. <coughs> so these are kind of major <laughs> innovations that have impacted all of our lives every day since that happened. Um, and it's also exciting to me to think about how someone with an English degree then takes their knowledge um, of the, the kinds of things that we teach students to do in an English department, close reading, um, learning and understanding of how people think about how humans interact with the worlds around them, the kinds of things that matter to us in the humanities, and then can take that knowledge and parlay it into building the kinds of tools that um, are uh, incredibly important in our everyday lives and that probably I'm gonna venture to say would not be as useful to us if they were not designed by someone who had the kind of depth and breadth of understanding that Dan has, I think, because he also comes from a background in the humanities. Um, so it's just a delight to have him here with us today. I really wanted Dan to come because um, although I have not yet had the opportunity, I've been doing administration mostly since I met Dan and learned about hypothesis, but I'm very, very convinced that this is a tool that has the potential to shape the way we work in higher ed um, more than almost any other innovation in the digital humanities or in the digital world because I think it offers the potential for new pedagogical practices, really innovative pedagogical practices, which some of our faculty are already pioneering, um, but also new modes of collaboration among scholars um, at a time when being able to work together to produce critical commentary that's also authoritative commentary on any content that's out there on the web is more important than ever before. So with that, I won't take up any more time. I'm going to let Dan um, come up here and tell us about this wonderful tool. Great. So welcome, Dan. Thank Thanks, you. Diane. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Um, this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, so thanks for having me. Um, it's great to be here. It's my first time at the U of U, or U squared, or whatever you guys affectionately refer to it as here. Um, and super impressed by all the stuff that's going on. I got to see the new um, DH Matter, or the uh, Digital Matter um, group. Um, thanks, Rebecca, and everybody. Um, and uh, university experience has come a long way since, since I have been in one, so it's, um, it's really exciting to see what's going on. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about a very, um, a very interesting new project. Um, some of you may have heard about it um, in an, an interesting new paradigm. Um, and um, why I um, decided to, to kind of divert from the for-profit world into this um, area and, and a little bit about what, um, what's happening and what you guys might expect to see over the next couple of years. So, um, so I work with a nonprofit called Hypothesis. Um, we have uh, about 15 people. I'll tell you a little bit more about it later. And we have um, a vision um, within the scholarly world, um, um, which is essentially to bring a, an open collaborative layer over all knowledge and, and all the things and, and um, bits and pieces that make up knowledge in terms of articles and books and images and art and, and media and, the, and so forth that this effectively are all on the web now. The, the amount of undigitized information that's still not on the web is getting smaller and smaller. You guys are an active part of Hathi Trust and continuing to scan your, your archives and you know we're, we're getting to the point where it's basically all on there. 
um, and certainly, uh, you know, the, the most important parts in terms of what, what they mean for our daily lives. So um, we think, and the reason why Hypothesis is a nonprofit is that it's super important that this technology be open based on standards um, and really built for the long term in terms of um, what, it's, what it can mean for, for all of us. Um, and the plan in terms of how to do that, in a, in a nutshell, is really to partner um, with um, the world's great publishers, libraries, um, um, platforms like Orchid and Internet Archive and Hockey Trust and so forth to, um, to develop, design, um, and roll out this, this platform um, so that you guys can all use it. Um, so, you know, the problem statement is kind of like, here's an article, um, and, it's, and it's been published. Um, actually, I think this is on archive, so technically it hasn't been published. But, you know, it's, it's basically gone to die. Um, somebody may incorporate, cite it at some point later, um, and, and then we'll continue to kind of have a life, you know, in, in the citation history of, of a paper. But there's no way for you to see anything really about what other people think about this, unless you can maybe Google, and, uh, unless it's been cited, perhaps, and then you can see what other actual formal papers are saying about it or how they're referring to it. Um, you could Google the title and see whether maybe Google might get lucky and give you like a blog post about it or something like that. But you can't see um, on the article, you know, like like a heads-up display or something, what other people think. Um, you can't see if there's been a correction. You can't see if there's been a retraction. You can't see if um, you know somebody tried to reproduce an experiment at a different temperature and, and you know the the author of the paper responded and said, oh, no, you know, try 85 degrees instead of 83 degrees. Um, so there's a lot of information that you're lacking because of the way publishing works um, and has worked for a very long time. So there's been a vision for how this might be different um, that goes way, way, way back. Um, kind of the, some of the earliest people um, that cite um, early influencers point to Vannevar Bush. Um, who was the first uh, head of the Office of Naval Research and uh, Time Man of, the, Man of the Year in 1943, um, and really a big thinker about information, imagined the web um, and, and how we might get here. And he, um, he imagined that, um, he, he kind of conceived of the concept of Wikipedia, this collaborative you know, thing, even before the infrastructure to create that thing might be possible, but he really first talked about this idea that all of us together might come um, collaboratively and um, create trails through knowledge, sharing our perspectives on the things um, that are out there um, in addition to just sharing the things that are out there. Uh, in um, Tim Berners-Lee and his um, um, kind of rough proposal for the web in um, 1989, um, one of the foundational nine principles of the web that he wanted to create is, um, was that it should be able to be annotated, surprisingly. Um, not only the, the, the nodes, the pages, but also the links um, between the pages. Um, and those two things, surprisingly, are the two fundamental design principles today of the way that annotation has been imagined to work. In 1993, Mark Andreessen, former U of I alum, um, who many of you may know created the first graphical web browser called uh, Mosaic, and then later he moved to Silicon Valley um, and started a company called Netscape, um, which is now essentially the spiritual origin of Mozilla, um, which brings us Firefox. So he, he put out in 1993 um, a note on a bulletin board saying, hey, I'm going to start a group annotation server um, and build it into Mosaic. Um, and so they did that, they turned it on for about a month, and so that the only browser that everybody was using back then was able to annotate every page on the web, and you were able to see um, the annotations in groups of people that you wanted to join with, and then they turned it off. Um, and he's written a blog post recently about how much he regrets that even though they didn't have the funding or the resources or whatever to be able to run this server that would have to scale, to web scale with every page new page it was added, um, he still regrets not having this 25-year history of layers of annotations and thinking on top of this, this web. So 
what we've gotten instead um, is this thing called the comment widget, um, which is you know down there at the bottom of pages. Um, it's really terrible. Um, you know, it's first of all, it's it's kind of below the fold as an afterthought at the bottom. It's implemented by the publisher. Um, it's, it's their agent, their, their vehicle, not your vehicle. Um, it's all proprietary tech. There are no open source uh, implementations of, of, of commenting systems that anybody uses. Um, it's you know a haven for trolls. You know it's poorly moderated and poorly really conceived as a way to generate high quality um, signal versus um, uh, low quality. So, but the other big problem is it's only on pages where it's implemented. So most of the web is quiet. Um, you go there, you see the page, um, but you don't see any activity, activity or thinking around it. If you want to see that, you go somewhere else. You, know, you go to Facebook or, it's, or you go to Reddit or you, know, you check Twitter to see if anybody's you know, pasted the URL in there and what they might have to say about it. Um, so we have um, an interesting um, technology that's been with us for a very, very, very long time called the annotation. Um, you know, the Talmud and you know, illuminated manuscripts from the mi Middle Ages you know, have these things, and the reason why people started doing them is because they were useful. Uh, that placed the thinking of a person, they didn't really mind scribbling in books back then too much. Um, and uh, um, so it, it, w it was a way to layer thinking of, from other people um, as, as a kind of a, a living um, guide and, and a living legend um, as people went. There are other solutions out there. Um, in the more of the STEM areas, people might be familiar with services like ResearchGate and Mendeley and academia.edu where you can take a document and you can upload it and you can have a collaborative conversation there. That's really f kind of forking the content. Like you've got to, you got to still do it over there. You can't really discover it um, where, where it is. So the, the idea, the, pr the promise is to build um, the, the capability to have number one, annotation, and number two, the most important thing is layers of annotation on top of the world around us, layers for any purpose that you might want for personal use, for classrooms, for small groups, for public channels, um, specialty communities that, that annotate for a specific purpose. Uh, machine annotation is something that we're seeing a tremendous amount of, annot of, of interest in, so lots of different groups want to create um, you know, machine reading um, systems that will take and process, do entity extraction, create annotated service layers that, that may be a benefit for you know, many folks. Um, so these, these annotations, like I said, lots of layers, lots of purposes. Um, and the other thing that's really important um, about the way that, that people have come together um, to conceive of this is that these layers of annotation can come from different servers. So this is not a monolithic um, new you know, Twitter where all tweets went through Twitter or, or Google Docs or, or something like that. This is kind of like the web um, where um, anybody can run a server, anybody can build client software that would be able to see these annotations or render them. Um, and that way you can uh, have a user interface control or paradigm that lets you see different layers and those different layers can come in, be coming from different um, places. The, this is all based on a new web standard as of February this year, the W3C, which is the standards body for the web, so they determine what, how HTML and CSS and other things like that get extended, has, has um, ended a four-year process um, of bringing this, this technology called web annotations through to formal approval. Um, and this means the most important thing is that um, people, number one, can have a, a shared understanding of how to build um, these technologies in a way that will be interoperable, number two, and number one, and number two, um, that browsers um, can start to build this stuff in natively so that your browser will come built in with the capability to, um, to um, create and uh, anchor uh, annotations um, and that you'll be, have the freedom as a, as a browser user to plug in whatever servers you want to um, be asking for, um, for relevant annotations on the pages that you go to. Um, not to get too geeky, but annotation um, in W3Speak involves um, uh, four things that we commonly know of as discrete concepts. They're actually simply permutations of the annotation model. 
So an annotation is the fully specified thing. It's, um, it's got a, a note, it points to a page, and then it points inside the page to, to a, um, a bit of text. A comment doesn't point inside the page, it's just a page level thing. Um, a highlight points inside to a sentence, but it doesn't have any, it doesn't say anything, it just highlights that. So, um, and then bookmarks um, don't point in and don't carry any text, but they mark um, a book uh, or a page or a document uh, in a way that we can save and archive and access later. We can start to tag all of the bookmarks that we make in the same tag structure that we're using to make annotations or highlights or comments. Um, and being able to combine these things in a fluid, single data model, very, very, very powerful. Um, so the class of, of applications that were, that are kind of in the crosshairs of this new paradigm are things like note-taking, um, things like tagging, um, Digo, Delicious, Pinboard, things like discussion, Reddit, Facebook, Twitter, and bookmarking stuff that tends to come um, natively inside your browser. Um, the goal of the, the W3C paradigm supports is, ag is format agnostic. All it needs is a selection um, to be specified for the particular data type, so text, um, EPUBs, um, which are text, uh, images, video, data, you name it. So we'll show you some examples. My goal, I'm gonna try to speed through this and get to the demo, kind of show you actually how it works. Um, so we're a nonprofit, like I said, um, funded through support of Mellon, uh, Omidyar, Sloan, Helmsley, Shuttleworth, Knight Foundation. Um, thankful. Um, we have a team of about 15. All we do is annotation. It's about half um, software developers and half program staff that help focus in verticals and uh, adoption. And the goal is, um, for us is to be shared new for neutral infrastructure, both from a services point of view to the point where people want us to run or host their annotations, but also from, from a code point of view um, to produce the absolute best of breed open source implementation reference implementation of this new technology um, and to partner uh, broadly and protect and preserve um, this this paradigm to the best that, that our organization can do that um, in a way that, that aligns long term with, with users. We do run a service ourselves at Hypothesis. You can go to our website, you can get a user account, you can start annotating the web right now. Um, we have about 100,000 users. We're on track for about 2 million annotations by the end of the year. Um, about a quarter of the annotations are public. Other people can see them. 50% of them are in private groups, um, so for classroom use or, you know, a bunch of authors are making notes. Um, sometimes people make um, groups just for themselves to help organize um, things. And then uh, 24, uh, the, the rest are personal, um, private uh, notes, just, just personal use. Um, so what, what's, you know, we're trying to think of what is going to drive the next billion annotations, um, which we th think will start to happen very rapidly. So these things I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, number one is true federation of the client. Our f client right now is still single server. Um, by the end of this year, we'll have um, extended the client to be able to listen to any server, uh, any compliant annotation server, including multiple servers simultaneously. So you'll be able to just to log into two or three servers. Like your company might want run one behind the behind their firewall, where you creating company confidential notes and collaborations. At the same time, you're listening to see on that piece of case law whether there were any private or public observations. Um, and then you and the client will also be able to automatically discover new servers as it as you go around the web. So the page might say, um, "There's a server over here that has authoritative annotations for this content." And, client will automatically go um, connect to that server and pull them in. So it's really interesting for publishers and, and other kinds of use cases. Um, publishers, platforms, um, integration is the key, really, from our perspective to, um, to use, making sure we support every format. I mean, you should not be able to essentially encounter something on the web that you can't reach into and annotate. That Google Doc, um, you should be able to annotate that. Even though it's got a commenting system, being able to use yours means that you can annotate against your account or with the same group structure that you used on that web page over there. So we, you know, the goal is to break apart these silos so that you've got that same fluid 
powerful capability everywhere. Spotify, you're storing, you know, or, or Shazam. You're, what are you doing when you're tagging all those songs? You're annotating them. Who's got that data? Shazam. How come you can't plug your annotation data, data store into Shazam and then tell Spotify to listen to that as your structure of tracks? Um, we, you know, the promise out here is to start to use these open pa paradigms to start to break apart these silos that provide useful services, but these are very brittle systems, ecosystems that aren't a good long-term architecture for humanity to do all the things we want to do. So um, uh, a couple years ago, we pulled together a consortium of schol first scholarly and, and educational publishers that have agreed to start integrating this. Um, so JSTOR, Elsevier, Wiley, Hathi Trust, Archive, PLOS, um, you know, most of the large publishers are part of this now, and we're beginning to roll out the integrations into their platforms. Yesterday, we just announced uh, MIT Press. Um, um, we'll be announcing NYU Press and a few others, and some of the other larger ones are very near to announcements um, as well. Um, and we also run a, a large uh, workshop every year called I Annotate uh, with about 150 um, people that come together to, to do hack and um, share stories and have a good time. So annotation is useful for a lot of things. Here's um, some, some user stories. I'm gonna dive down into some of these, but there's a lot of different kinds of ways that you can, you can use annotation. Let me kind of um, power through a couple of these. So the classic um, use case, kind of the, the equivalent of comments on the web is post-publication discussion. So here's uh, somebody who's annotated an article um, at Archive, the same article I showed you before, and he's, you know, his article, his research was cited in this article, and so he's gone in and said, hey, it's really great that, you know, thanks for citing my work, but, you know, folks might also want to look at this other one, um, and, you know, goes on to make a few other notes um, in, in the preprint, very interesting use case for preprints because, you know, they're not peer reviewed, but you know, potentially um, uh, collaborative annotation on top of them can be a, a way for, for the article to improve perhaps on the way to publication. Here's an example of a researcher uh, whose paper, who is the, one of the co-authors of the paper, who's gone and later and annotated their own work to talk about some additional projects that they're working on. So this is um, good, you know, one of the most authoritative person, people about a paper is, of course, the author. Um, so how come they can't go back and provide, uh, be, have a system that's completely within their control outside the publisher, which lets them provide additional context um, as, as um, the corrections and so forth as time goes on. Um, publisher layers are something we're seeing an absolute tremendous amount of interest in. So, you know, the journals are kind of like, well, this is interesting, but I don't really want to stick this thing on my journal um, and just invite, you know, kind of conversations and discussion that I can't moderate. So this, but on the users, on the other hand, want to be able to go to that article and basically annotate and not necessarily be moderated by the publisher. Um, and bring all their communities and groups and everything with them. So how do you just uh, solve this standoff? Well, the, the architecture kind of lends itself to the solution, which is that the publisher can specify on, in the, the page template for the article an authoritative server for that article. And the, the inter interface will show that server, and this, this is an article by eLife. eLife is about to roll out um, um, this technology. There are, Open Access Life Sciences Journal. And so here the eLife discussion layer is on top. If you're not logged into Hypothesis, you won't see that there are any other annotation layers. So the casual person who doesn't even know about this will only see the kind of publisher-sponsored and moderated discussion. So eLife will have full moderation rights over that layer that they control. But if the person wants to sign in, create an account, um, and um, go create groups or have a general discussion they can. Interestingly, publishers have been okay with this compromise where they're, um, you know, until the person knows about it, um, their layers are the only ones that, um, that are shown. Peer review, I'll show you some more slides on this later. We have a big announcement um, this week. Um, we've in a, 
um, this technology is starting to be integrated into submission workflow systems. So eJournal Press, which is one of the um, submission workflows that journals use, um, um, you can, uh, instead of writing a long form review in the Microsoft Word document where you say on page three, in section two, you know, I had this note, you can just go annotate it. Um, and those annotations flow into the eJournal Press system, but they're all um, formatted with the open um, standard and the editors now can selectively go in and take interesting conversations and publish them as a layer that will flow along and be visible on the actual eventual pub published article. Um, so this is, um, this is an area that we're, we're pretty interested in. Um, entity um, uh, annotation um, is one, I'm gonna talk about a little bit more about this later. Um, illuminated footnotes, so bringing interesting information in um, the citation, the footnotes, or the bibliography forward um, so that you can kind of see what's being talked about, see whether it might be interesting, um, and then click straight through to that document wherever it is without having to go to Google. Um, uh, journal clubs, um, we've got a bunch of journal clubs now, so instead of just having to get together in person to talk about that, that those three papers on Thursday night, you can get together, but then you know, they might send the three papers out um, you know, at the beginning of the week and you can start to read them and start to make notes in that private layer um, in ways that you know, is, is confident, you know, kind of protected and private to the journal clubs, especially if you're an early career researcher, you're you know, able, you, know, you can ask that dumb question that you know, maybe would have been obvious if you were you know, 10 years further in, into your career. Um, and, and do exactly what journal clubs are about, which is um, learning more about um, science. Um, and then the classroom use. So we're seeing a lot, 60% uh, of our use right now in classrooms um, who, you know, the teacher will um, um, issue, uh, you know, um, assign a bunch of material, and then the students can come and help each other, basically ask questions um, about that material, and the teacher can see, oh, what, you know, what are people struggling with? How should I spend my time when we all come together um, you know, during class? Um, we're starting to build shims for all the LMS systems. We have an alpha shim for Canvas. Um, so you can pull, drag and drop the material straight out of the, your, your can, the, what you've already put into Canvas um, and wrap it with uh, the hypothesis interface and assign a group um, for the class just so you know, if you have different sections or whatever, they can all be in their own space. Um, but then if you want to teach something that's not, that you didn't put in the LMS, the, 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 the students can just grab the extension and go to whatever New York Times article it was. That same group that you've created inside the Canvas environment will be available. Um, and um, so it's a great way to kind of start to blend the boundaries between these systems that have been very siloed. For instance, I don't know if you guys use Ex Libris here for as a um, interface to um, library resources, um, but you know Ex Libris kind of has its own user interface. Canvas has its own user interface. They don't. There's shims between them, but they don't. Still, don't really work like a single system. Um, here, you'd be able to see no matter where you enter the library resource through ProQuest, through Ex Libris, or whatever to the document you'd be able to see the same annotations in the same layers that um, you were interested in. Um, another interesting use case um, we're seeing is our community. So here the kind of the, the, the idea is what if we were able to take um, the combined expert expertise of the world's most knowledgeable people and use it, deploy it really as a public service um, over uh, knowledge news uh, and so forth. So. We have a class of folks called professional fact checkers, Snopes, Photofact, et cetera. Very small, understaffed. Um, and then we've got another group of really enormous um, group of, of folks, which is really everybody that knows any you know, uh, special experts in their field. Um, much more credible. Um, you know, as soon as you know, folks see S Snopes, some people go, oh, great. So that's what Snopes had to say. As other people go, oh, Snopes, right. I don't know those guys. But if it's you know, the people that really know the, the world's experts on the Zika virus, they've got a lot more agency and credibility than because they're specialists. 
um, and that's what they do all day. So we're, we, there's a group, um, interesting group called Climate Feedback. This is um, a group out of Berkeley. They run their own annotation layer, um, and they annotate climate news and rate it. So this is, you know, some article in Telegraph. They've come along and said, and and you know, the the article in the Telegraph might have quoted a few recent studies. Climate feedback, because they're you know the world's top climate scientists, they'll just go find the guy that wrote the article um, that was cited, bring him into the annotating group, and have him you know or her um, you know point out you know whether this was accurate or not, or you know what the nuance was that was lost in translation. So we're super excited about this paradigm of. Um, of, of communities. We're about to launch um, our communities initiative this fall to bring more of these folks on. And we asked ourselves, you know, what might the next hundred communities be? I mean, you can imagine um, specialty communities on constitutional law that would annotate, you know, leaked drafts of stuff coming out of subcommittee in Washington or um, folks that have, you know, a lot of experience in cybersecurity or <coughs> hurricanes or whatever it is, um, the, um, you know, if you're on a page where one of these communities has agency, um, you might s all of a sudden see there might be a little alert that says, hey, this is a high profile group that a lot of people are following with a high credibility score um, is annotating. Do you want to see that specific layer? Giving communities layers gives them agency, allows them to control their voice, whereas typically in comment widgets, they, they're the first to leave. Uh, because the lowest common denominator um, basically controls the conversation. So let me show you kind of how it works. So I was going to be all cool and come up with a, a um, digital humanities example here, but let me just um, uh, use um, a Springer article on, this is an open access article on earthquakes, and so this capability is not implemented at Springer. Um, this is just a, a, an article that's um, in my browser. Um, I could turn on um, the Chrome extension, which is one of four ways you can bring the annotation technology to a page. Uh, and then I can come along and um, annotate. So let me, um, let me go to I can go to the public channel, for instance, and I can say, oh, uh, so I, hopefully I would say something quite interesting, other than just that's interesting, um, and make a note. Um, and so there it is. The annotation is um, stuck to that um, to that piece of text. You know, I can go on and I'll make another one down here. And so now there's two annotations. So. And, you know, I can use the cards to kind of browse the page to take me um, to where um, those annotations are. I can grab a link to any annotation anywhere on any document and then immediately share it with somebody um, like that, put it out in a tweet, embed it as a link in a, in a text, um, and then you know it takes them you know, straight to that article. Even if they don't have the annotation technology, um, they're not aware of it, it's not, they haven't pulled out the extension or anything. Um, so, um, that's, um, that's how that works. Um, and then, you know, if, um, for instance, let me go to download PDF. So here's the same article um, in um, PDF form. I turn on the extension um, and um, the annotations um, that I made are automatically in the right place on the PDF. So the technology knows it can read all the metadata on the page. It knows what the DOI is, what the all the URLs that are in well-formed scholarly articles are in the metadata um, behind the page, and it automatically says, "Oh, this PDF is um, a is this article," and pulls them over. And I can go backwards the other way here, so I can annotate here and say, "Hey." Um, and then, um, look where this is here. There's a new annotation on the page. I can pull it down. And, um, there's my annotation on that part of the, the HTML that came from the, the PDF side. Um, so, 
And it also, it works on the fingerprints of PDFs. So one of the really cool things is, and harder to demo here, but I can take this PDF um, and save it um, to, um, to my desktop, um, however I do that, uh, and email it to, um, um, to you, and you can pull it from your email um, into your browser turn on Hypothesis and you'll see all the annotations on it because it doesn't need even need a URL. It can go just off the, the binary hash that's native to, to all PDFs. Um, so that means that, you know, that whole corpus of scholarly articles that, you know, you've been saving for whatever reason on your hard drive or carrying around as you leave your computer or storing them in Dropbox or something like that, you um, can see the annotations on those without having to go back to the original version. Um, and so forth. Um, another thing that we're really um, interested in is data. So um, here is here's a CSV file um, somewhere on the web. That, um, uh, this one happens to be a list of um, publicly traded companies and little bits and pieces of data on them. So if I drag this into um, the hypothesis annotator like this, it um, turns it into um, a, takes the, the CSV file, you know, runs it in an HTML table, and then I can just go annotate um, the data. So, um, actually I forgot one thing I was going to show you. So, um, so let, let me, instead of annotating in the public channel, let me create a group. So I can create a group very easily. So let's click this group, uh, uh, earthquakes. Um, and now this group called Earthquakes that I just made is available to me, and I can create an annotation here, and I can tag it, um, you know, um, Quake 1, and, you know, then maybe I can um, make another annotation here, um, tag this one uh, like this, and uh, call it Quake 2. Um, and maybe some, you know, uh, Italy. Um, and um, I could, you know, make an annotation on the HTML version. Again, go back to my uh, earthquake group. Um, like so. Looks like I've made some other annotations in this group before um, on this document. Make another tag. Um, and so these groups, these this group becomes a way for me to start to accumulate um, annotations on, um, um, on documents wherever I go, um, and it works across formats. So that CSV file I can now also annotate um, here like this. Um, I could link to this, um, grab the link to this annotation maybe, and um, um, maybe point, link one annotation to another. Check out this data. So, I'm going to make that a hypertext link that points to the annotation I just made. So now I've taken this piece of a, um, of an article and I've linked it straight to, um, directly into a CSV file. Um, and when I link there, it actually scrolls me over to that, to that cell, puts me into that group and, and shows me that, that annotation. So we can start to link, um, annotate the links between nodes, um, uh, as Vanna, uh, as Tim Berners-Lee was imagining. So um, one of the things we've been working very hard on is um, getting the next um, format in place. So um, uh, earlier in the year, we had wanted to do EPUBs for a long time. Um, EPUBs, EPUBs are pretty tricky. They're, they're HTML, but they're all zipped up, and they got spines and weird um, ways to 
they're all reflowable, so there's no one single page. It's like the reader dictates what you know the pages are that you see. Special, you know, creates all kind of special um, considerations. So there's two primary open source um, EPUB frameworks. One's called ReadMJS that was created by the group called IDPF, which is owns now part of the W3C, which which kind of manages the W the, the EPUB spec. And then there's another wildly po popular framework called EPUBJS. So we partnered with both of those groups and NYU Press and then integrated um, with those two frameworks. So as of this last week, I can take an EPUB. So I'll take this really interesting one called 100 Proofs That the Earth Is Not a Globe. And um, um, here's a little EPUB from Project Gutenberg. And I can drag and drop it onto our little test site. So this is a way to get um, um, oh, whoops. That's not the test site. Um, so, uh, so here it is. Now it's it's in EPUB JS, um, and I can flip through it like a book. Um, and I could embed this book on a page in a frame, packaged with the the reader, if I wanted to. If I was uh, um, running um, a, a press or a library where all of our titles were available, some of them might be uh, behind DRM um, and, and watermarked and so forth, or some of them might be open access. Um, and um, then I can annotate them. Uh, oops. Oh, I knew this was, no, we get a little bug. Anyway, um, let me annotate the book. Um, this was working this morning, but broken yesterday. So it's, I was hoping. Um, anyway, you can see that my group, um, the context is still here from, um, from across the web that I've been annotating with a bunch of people. I can make an annotation um, in, this, um, in this book on that page, um, you know, as pulled from um, the, that particular press um, and stick it there and organize it with tags and so forth. Um, and, um, and so this, and, and you know, use that, have that context with me wherever um, I'm going. Uh, annotations, actually one other thing really quick that's kind of interesting. Annotations don't have to be just text. Um, you can also stick cool things in them like, um, if I wanna stick, um, for instance, video. And so there I've got a YouTube video that I can play right from the, uh, the annotation card. Um, annotations can also um, have uh, like math in them. Um, so you can uh, say I want to put some, some <coughs> LaTeX in there. So there's an equation. Um, which is fully selectable and annotatable itself. Um, we've, um, we're expanding the media formats. We've just um, um, expanded the framework so that we can, you can go to the Internet Archive's TV News Archive, which some of you may be familiar with. So they've been um, recording 60 channels of video for the last 15, 12 or 15 years now. And you can get any snippet of any um, anything that's been on CNN for the last 10 years, um, and you can dive down into, you know, 30-second bit where somebody says something about something else and drop that right in an annotation card, for instance, as a, as a way to kind of uh, annotate um, with media. Um, so um, so let, me, let me kind of go back to our... Um, our, our um, browsing interface. So this was my group um, here, um, the earthquake group. I've annotated a few more things. Here was the data that uh, um, table that I was annotating. Um, here are the tags that I was using. So if I want to narrow um, the document, this is a faceted search. So I can add the, the data tag up there and just look at the one annotation that was tagged data. Um, I can see all the members um, that were in this group, so it's just me to begin with. So if I, 
you know, I click on my member name, then I can scope um, again the search query by by a, a particular user and a tag and a group. I can just look at all of my annotations, so I can go to my user profile. These are, you know, the 1,200 annotations I've made over the last few years, um, you know, in all kinds of documents, you know, and I can go and just go there from any document, any any annotation I've made. I can always click and go straight back to the um, to the the document, scroll right to the to the place. People can come along and reply to the annotations of the fully threaded model. Somebody wants to come along and say something um, to, to that. I will get a notification that somebody's replied to my annotation anywhere on the web. Um, so um, there's a lot of interesting things that you can start to build with this. So here's um, a project called Cybot. Cybot is a project of the Neuroscience Information Framework at UCSD. They've created an annotating robot um, that goes and pulls a new kind, scans the scholarly literature for a new kind of identifier. And the identifier is called an RRID. So let's go look at one of these. So I'll click on that annotation card. And here is an a article in PubMed Central um, on uh, something high fat diets. And this RRID, um, the um, biologists have created um, over the last couple of years because there were these articles were mentioning all these things like antibodies and reagents that were very specific down to the manufacturer. Like if you wanted to reproduce the experiment, you'd have to actually know. But that information wasn't in the article. Um, so what they did was come up with an identification scheme like a DOI. Those are now embedded in articles. And now the Cybot goes and annotates every RRID and every article that comes out so that instead of having to cut and paste that and put it into Google, um, you can just click on it and see which, um, you know, which manufacturer created this. Um, you can see um, um, all the other articles that it was mentioned in. Um, and you can click on it and you can see all the other articles that were tagged with that particular um, RRID. So you can kind of use, start to use that as an easy way to pivot through the literature. Um, and this use of tags is a really, really powerful um, thing that we're, we're that a lot of people are starting to, to leverage. Um, we're about to to release uh, um, um, maybe a little bit later next year um, a um, structured um, tag capability. So you'll be able to load a reference external control of vocabularies or dictionaries um, that communities maintain and, and, and so forth. Um, Let's see, um, another interesting project, um, the Syracuse Qualitative Data Repository is starting to um, form partnerships with publishers um, to where whenever a, a Syracuse, uh, uh, um, a, a piece of evidence in an article that's published that points to um, a, something that was stored with the Syracuse repository, They'll annotate the, um, uh, let's find a, a good example here. Um, they'll annotate the, the area, the, the place where that, um, um, that uh, citation was mentioned in the article and show you the thumbnail of the, th of the, of the um, element that's stored in QDR. You can read a little bit about it. This is actually in Spanish, so you can see the Spanish and the translation of it. Um, and then you can go there. You can go to the, the actual uh, document as stored um, in, uh, at the repository and, and you know, read it. But you, you'll click on it knowing what you're going to and, and knowing most of the relevant information about it um, ahead of time. So that's, that's pretty interesting. We're seeing a lot of potential for this. Um, publishers are very interested in, in kind of enhancing their articles um, with these different kinds of, of more structured machine driven um, annotations. Um, the e-journal press integration I talked about, um, I'll just, just show you kind of the simple few slides here. Uh, 
so um, basically what they wanted to be able to do was um, allow re uh, reviewers, editors, authors to mark up manuscripts, um, Im implement all the blinding um, requirements for the review model that's in place, um, override the tag editor with their structured tags to classify the different kinds of um, interventions to be able to filter by all that stuff and have it stored in their database. So here now, as of this week, um, um, uh, AGU, which is the which was kind of the co-development partner with us and eJournal Press, is rolling this out to all 19 of their journals, so that the um, um, the reviewers can annotate if they want to do an, uh, an annotated um, review can can click on that. Uh, this is kind of a little bit backwards, but you know they'll come to the the manuscript. Um, they'll see um, the annotations. Um, if they're the editor, so this is kind of the editor's view. The editor can see that it's reviewer one and who the person is, um, what was said. Um, the tags, whether it was a major comment or a minor one, um, et cetera, um, uh, whether or not the, um, the annotation is something that, that should not be shown to authors um, or something that can be shown to authors. Um, they can filter um, the, the annotations through the, um, the scope control um, by, by any of the diff these different parameters. Um, for the reviewers, it's easy to create the annotation kind of in the same way that you do already. Um, you know, just add whatever you need. All the capabilities of the editor are there. They can use YouTube videos or math or, or whatever. Um, they, can, uh, they can file that away. Um, decision letters that have all that information are automatically <coughs> generated um, um, and created into a PDF so they can be sent to, to authors um, and so forth. So that's. Um, that is the review stuff. I'll cut it, just end it there. I've kind of already explained that stuff. And um, take your questions. science at it, is there a way for the author to remove that? So or, that's... Or, or, or to challenge it? I mean, I, right. I, I see great things with this, but I can also see bad things like, like that happening. Yeah, so there's really, you know, that the, the goal of having lots of layers with lots of potential communities moderating them is, is specifically to address that problem, which is, you know, the biggest problem. Um, and... The one channel that is unique amongst all of them is the one we call public, which is the channel that's, that's um, visible by default. So right now we've been ex existing in a kind of a beautiful um, paradise where this is still all relatively early adopters. We have a set of community guidelines, we enforce them, occasionally people break them, um, and we, you know, we address that and either turn off the annotation to where it's just visible to them, we don't delete it, um, we just make it private. Um, or we, you know, if it's a problem person, then we'll, you know, kind of turn it there or, or kind of um, turn all, make all of their annotations private. So they can still continue to use the service um, to make personal notes or whatever, but um, nobody else can, can see them. Um, or they, and they can participate in private groups, but they can't participate in the public channel. So um, the question that we have is, you know, how long are we going to be able to, you know, clearly in order to scale this further, we'll have to pull the community in to do community-based moderation. Um, we have to build a set of tools to enable that. Um, for us, whether or not we can continue to have the public channel operate and, and provide its functionality is an open question. You know, it's experimental hypothesis. Um, we know that Wikipedia's got some fantastic approaches that have been relatively successful to do this. We know it's possible. Um, we have um, we have a, um, a, a very strong um, uh, advantage in that because we're a nonprofit, we don't have to generate commercial revenue by pumping numbers and generating ads. So we're not naturally disposed to allow anybody to say anything because um, of of that outcome. So um, you know, for us, from our perspective, annotation is a, is a privilege, um, not a right, in, in the public channel. Um, 
And you know, the, the great thing about the architecture is if you want to just create a really you know, terrible place for anybody to say anything, you can go start your own annotation server and run that, and people can subscribe to it. Um, and maybe they will. Um, there are certainly places like that on the web. So that, that's the simple answer. being able to um, create these communities and bring your community to wherever you browse on the web, right? That's really what I think that's what's most robust about this uh, platform, rather than just going to a social media site and having uh, your community just post stuff from the web. So you bring your community to the web rather than your community bringing the web to you, right? Uh, but relate to, uh, I'm sorry, what was your name again? Peter's question was uh, a concern of mine with regards to the balkanization of the web, right? So what is to stop a bunch of community members who use hypothesis who are interested in denying climate science or anti-vaccination and just subscribe to that channel and bringing that uh, kind of discourse to wherever they browse on the web, right? Uh, I mean, is that something that you guys have thought about? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Here's, the, here's the philosophy behind the whole thing. It's open. People, you know, people will be able to create their own layers. Um, you know, we'll, we have some guidelines that we've created in terms of what we consider discourse that we are willing to host on our platform, and then a separate set of rules for things that we'll be willing to host in our public channel. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't, would not see a violation of our guidelines. Somebody, you know, uh, creating a group with, you know, just terrible information in it. Um, and so the, the, the thing, the way that, that we believe that this works is um, that um, the question number one is, you're on the page, you'll be able to discover that there are multiple groups with different perspectives. Um, there may be on that same page a group of climate scientists um, that you know, know what they're talking about that have um, also weighed in. So you'll be able to see both perspectives. Um, as opposed to just seeing one, um, you know, which might be that skeptics page that you landed on because a, your friend posted in Facebook um, and said all things from one perspective um, and didn't include that other perspective. So from our perspective, um, letting people see that if those different channels, providing a lot of metrics about the reason why one channel might be dramatically more um, credible than another. And like, for instance, it might be just the number of people that are following that channel. Um, number two might be um, the co whether that channel has posted a, a code of conduct um, that stands the test of time. Um, you know, the credibility, the, the participation of the individual members, and where, what their bona fides are. But also, um, you know, does the um, channel allow replies from non-members moderated perhaps to flow in as responses to their annotations? Um, and, um, you know, do they allow a perspectives from people that are, you know, outside of their um, zone of, of influence or whatever? Um, so there's a lot of, th you know, this is all kind of greenfield for us. Um, we need to experiment, see what works, partner with people that have solved some of these problems in terms of applying a lot of automation um, to the problems like there's a lot of Bayesian um, analysis you apply on annotations um, to, do, to you know, see whether the toxicity score for, um, for a channel, you know, how does it rate in terms of the, the, just the tempo or the style of discourse that they tend to use in their channel as an overall metric for the channel. So I think there's some powerful things that we can, that techniques that we can use um, to, to get at some of that. One of the strengths of it seems to be that it's a kind of central place for the things that I think a lot of us have been doing piecemeal, kind of like a Kluge style. So you know, I've used the Genius Annotator, the Chrome extension, and maybe like five or six years ago, the Institute for the Future of the Book had something called Social Book, which yeah. I used is really Bob cool. Project. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's fantastic to be able to have all of those piecemeal things integrated into one place. I'm wondering, in terms of siloization that you mentioned, is there any kind of effort to communicate with those already existing? Big time. So you can yeah. 
So have that? our conference that we throw, we invite Bob Stein has spoken probably three times there. Genius has come presented presented uh, presented three times on their project. So we kind of encourage everybody to come, compare notes. Um, when the when we launched the working group at the W3C, we invited a lot of the, the people that were there, and you know I think you know, the people that were clearly trying to solve this problem in a coordinated community-based way showed up. Um, and, um, you know, the others, you know, um, you know, that weren't so interested or incentivized to be more open um, tended to, you know, um, you know, show up or do a hit and run, but, you know, not really participate over the long term. Yeah, well, that, that is a question, uh, it's a great question. Um, two things, one is Genius is um, uh, terminating their web annotating project. Um, they're pivoting back to lyrics. Um, and, um, but the larger question, I think, assuming that hadn't been the case, is that if, you know, I, I think that puts a tremendous amount of pressure on them to essentially open their API um, so that their service because there are two things, right? There are technology and a service. Um, their service can be discovered by other open annotation clients so that you could see the genius annotation alongside the other one. If the world is starting to annot add annotation services that you can browse openly in a client, kind of like a web browser, but to see these other annotations, you've got to go get a special browser, and you can only see those annotations in that browser, it puts a, a tremendous amount of natural pressure on them um, to, to you know, move to the standard. Thanks very much. I've got a, a couple of questions about um, about teaching applications. Uh, given, I mean, it's not a, a core necessarily, but it's definitely something you guys are obviously very interested in. Um, one is a pretty straightforward question about um, the fact that you know what you were showing us was was browser integration on what looks like a fairly typical like desktop or a laptop. What about other like mobile devices? It the works on mobile. There's mobile integration. It needs. There's a lot more that we can do to optimize it for mobile. Yeah. Um, but. It does work. Um, you know, there's a, a Firefox, um, once we get our Firefox integration up, Firefox mobile allows plugins to be able to, be able to have a version that you can create and make annotations um, um, on mobile. Um, you, you know, you can browse to annotations now if you're on your mobile device, if somebody sends a link to you. Um, but there's a really a lot more, more, more that can be done, like, you know, if I'm, taking pictures with my phone, um, how come I can't tag them with the same tag set that I'm using, um, you know, to tag my documents? Like maybe I'm actually taking a picture of a, um, of a, uh, you know, of a field sample for my research and um, I should be able to tag it, you know, along with the tag set that I'm using for the whole research project. And I should be able to do that right from within. So Apple's not going to integrate that into you know, their iPhoto app, but we might be able to get a third party um, app um, to do that first and then force you know, these guys to open up you know, their, t their system. I mean, it's actually surprising you can't tag photos um, in Apple iPhoto now. I could, like, astonishing to me. Um, but so there's a lot of mobile is a huge category. It represents you know, just the narrowest bit is you know, creating and viewing annotations, but there's really just a lot of a lot of potential applications. The other question I, thanks for that. Uh, the other question I had was about, um, I mean, you mentioned Canvas and the ways in which, say, it, it almost looked kind of like what you were describing was a copy and paste operation where you can go back and forth. But I'm wondering about the possibility of closer integration, and specifically just as someone who also wears an administrative hat and has to think about things like assessment, um, is it possible for the application to work with a CMS like Canvas to capture a level of student, like number of annotations or quality of annotations, something like that? Yeah, we're starting to work on those. We've integrated with SpeedGrader in Canvas, so we've got at least the basics of, of assessment. Um, but attention um, and other kinds of metrics, um, time on page, annotations, um, are all things that, I mean, are like definitely should, you know, it's, it's egregious that that you can't get that information in Canvas now from, from this application. So those are um, on the roadmap. Um, so, so come as soon as we can build them. 
Uh, just curious about, if, if, say I make an annotation on a web page that then changes or disappears altogether, I'm just, I'm guessing those annotations still exist in my user profile, but what do they link to at that point? Yeah, so if you, um, so we have the, what's called orphans, um, and uh, if you make an annotation, it, the fuzzy, the, the text anchoring um, uses the selection of the, the sentence and then 32 bytes on either side, either side of the sentence to dynamically re-anchor the annotation to the page. Um, and that's why it works between HTML and PDF because actually it, the text in HTML and PDF is not always exactly the same. Spaces are sometimes gone between words. Things break differently, but they're close enough that the edit distance tolerance of the, the algorithm um, is able to um, to anchor them within, you know, kind of as long as there's 70% of the same material in the sentence there, which is also important for things like news articles, which change dramatically through the course of the day as as the article as the story breaks and then they continue to go back and re-edit. Um, but if it fails because you know it was on the second sentence and they ripped out the whole paragraph and so just no chance, then it's orphaned. There's a separate um, channel on the sidebar uh, which only shows up if there are orphans on the page. And um, you can, so you can still see them. They're always in your profile, um, but um, you can see at least um, when you're on the page that there were some that didn't anchor. Um, the cool project that we're working on, um, the Internet Archive um, is about to integrate Hypothesis into the Wayback Machine. Um, so, um, um, the, so you'll be able to go and to old versions of articles and annotate them. Um, but the other part of the project that we're working on with them is that when you annotate, every time you annotate, it'll send, um, it'll ping their, what's called their save page API with the URL and tell it, tell it to go grab the page. And so if the page changes, they will have scanned the page within five minutes of when you originally made the annotation. And if, you, if the annotation orphans, you'll sh shortly be able to go say, take me to the archived version um, and um, re-anchor the annotation to the article the way it was when it was originally made. Um, so that's becoming a bigger and bigger need for people. It's surprising how much of the web changes. Um, it's something like every, you know, 40% of pages are dramatically different within 90 days and within, you know, a year, something like 30% of all pages are gone crazy statistics like that. So it's a big, a big deal, um, something we're excited about. Rebecca. Hi, thank you for that, Dan. So I think what's so exciting is to think there's limitless applications to this technology. And even when I think of a particular document, I think of the different ways that people might annotate and for different audiences. So for instance, if you have a climate science report or a Supreme Court decision, you can imagine how you know, someone might annotate it for a very high level specialized audience where someone else might want to annotate it so that the, the common man could understand something that's sort of complicated. So how could someone, I mean, how would you parse those annotations and how could you create ways where you, you go and find what you're looking for, the tone, you know, the level. With Wikipedia, for instance, they really say write for a non-technical audience, write at an eighth grade level, spell out your acronyms. but you know, with hypothesis, that's not the purpose. You know, it's not just for a general audience. It might be for a very specialized audience. Yeah. So how do, you, how do you make that work? Well, um, glad you asked. Um, so Science in the Classroom, which is a AAAS project, um, is using, um, oh, I've got this weird cursor thing going on. Um, is using hypothesis to annotate um, um, articles for lay audiences. Um, so this, you know, I won't bother to go show you all this stuff, but um, they'll take a scholarly paper um, and then they'll, um, they'll annotate it so you can, um, I think, yeah, you can go and you can see that there's annotations. I can't mouse over to that so I can't show you how cool it is. But you can see that um, the hypothesis sidebar is on the right-hand side. And so this is in a layer of lay annotations targeted at a certain um, age range. Um, so our thinking is maybe 
we can start to classify, um, um, like if you've created an annotation layer for a specific purpose and it's for, for instance, um, uh, translation for um, different age ranges or something, we will let you tag the group layer as being for a certain purpose um, and then you could start to browse those sets of layers run by lots of different organizations targeted at different types for, um, for all the interesting stuff that happened today that was targeted at a lay audience in, you know, neurobiology or something like that. Um, awesome. annotations in the browser natively? Um, so we're talking to Mozilla. They have a project um, called Test Pilot. Um, Test Pilot is a, a cohort of 100,000 users that test um, new concepts um, that um, would be brought in via typically via plugin, um, but they're candidates for being made native. Um, so our goal is to see now that we're, our Firefox plugin is almost done, which we probably a requirement for that, um, and then um, to work with them over the next year to say, um, you know, what would, what would, what makes a successful test pilot run? We want to make sure we're kind of well prepared for that. We need to get all the multi auth back end stuff done so that it's not, we're not asking them to bake hypothesis the service <coughs> into the browser only, only the, the open client. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess, my guess would be to say three years maybe, um, but we could probably, if for the major, for the majors, but um, there's probably a few others like Brave um, um, that we might be able to do a little bit sooner um, or just roll our own, um, you know, just take a WebKit or, or Chromium or something like that and just make a copy that's got the, the annotation client in it. Um. Everybody's finished if there's like one more question, maybe we can take that, but we do need to get down on a plane. So. <laughs> <laughs>